Pastor Brenda has asked me if I would go ahead and proceed with delivering the word. I know the spirit of God is moving, but if you want to move back to your seats, we're just, it's one of the most incredible things about these conferences is the flow just keeps going. Amen. And what you're receiving and basking in right now, you can take with you right back to your seat. Stay in that realm of the presence of the Lord. Get your Bibles ready if you want to take notes. Get some things out, and we're going to go into um, the ministry of the Word for just a few moments. What a powerful service and a powerful delivery that Pat uh, brought forth uh, in this last session. And we're going to move ahead. Amen. Hallelujah. Building and building through tonight's service and then tomorrow morning will just be awesome. Amen. It's just building in each session, the, the spirit and uh, the move of the spirit. And so I'm excited about what God's doing. Praise the Lord. If you would please turn to um, Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Wait just a moment. A lot of the people are leaving, so I'm going to let them go ahead and, and everybody get situated, and we'll move on. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose... Have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth? Several years ago, the Lord really dealt with me about this passage of Scripture. Ladies, you and I have been raised up for a purpose. We have been brought forth for this time, for this season, for a purpose. And it is because that God is looking for a people who will go forth and declare his name, and he's looking for a people that will demonstrate his power. He wants to demonstrate his power, and he generally does it through a vessel. Now, he has the ability to just show up and to, to cause uh, earthquakes, to cause things to take place and shakings to take place even through inanimate objects. But generally, he works through a yielded vessel. And I believe that God is looking for women who are going to rise up who are going to say that I am going to be yielded to him to operate through my life. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, and I, I know the Lord showed me that there are many who do not have the baptism in the Holy Spirit that are here. You've been pressing into the presence of God, and I just believe that uh, before this conference is over, that, that you are going to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But... When you were filled, for those of you that are filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think that we got confused about the purpose. And we began to think that the purpose was just so we could have this secret private language to communicate in the spirit realm with God. And so that it would make us feel good when we would enter into this atmosphere uh, with the Holy Spirit operating through our lives. But that was not the purpose. The Holy Spirit, the word, uh, the Greek word dunamis, you all are familiar with it, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It's like a dynamo. It has the capability of reproducing after its kind. And the Lord is looking for women who are willing to say, I am going to reproduce in the spirit realm. I'm going to give birth in the spirit realm to others who will go forth demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit. But we can't do that. We can't reproduce that type of a, of a flow unless we're walking in it ourselves. And, and if there's ever been a time that we need to demonstrate his power, it's now. 
when I, when I go into places, when I go into uh, secular places, I go into businesses, I go into restaurants and, and, and stores, I tune into the Spirit. I ask God to show me people that I can go up to and I can begin speaking to them and, so to speak, reading their mail, prophesying to them, giving them the word of the Lord. That is what they need. Now, and I think this flows well with what Pat was saying earlier. She was sharing and talking about what they're going to be doing in Las Vegas and, and they were sharing yesterday about doing some things in Arizona and how they're going to go forth and, and to demonstrate his power. And so often we allow ourselves to be controlled by intimidation, which is totally demonic. It is not of God because we are not to have a spirit of fear within our life. But we allow ourselves to be bound by intimidation and we'll hear the prophetic words come forth and we'll, hear, we'll read the word of God, but we'll begin to think that it applies to everyone else and that it does not apply to us. And so we never press in for those experiences to take place in the spirit realm. And so today, one of the things I want to challenge you about is to understand that the Word of God, it, 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 the promises of God, they are yea and amen. And we are living in the time when it's time for our daughters to prophesy. And it is time for us to raise up and, and to bring forth the miraculous, doing great and mighty exploits throughout all the land. We should not be intimidated. We should not be afraid. We should not run in fear. We should be looking for opportunities to demonstrate the power of our God. Some of you have heard me share this before, but I feel prompted to share this. One of the times in our church when my, my husband was ministering, and it was, it was late night, and uh, uh, my daughter Bethany was about seven years old at this time. And she was in a children's church service, which was in an entirely different building than, than where we were having our service. It was nine o'clock at night, the door is open, this guy comes in. And my husband laid his microphone down and he walked back to him. He said, I know who you are. You're a warlock. You've come in here to cause disruption into this service. You've come in here to bring distraction. And I'm going to tell you, I welcome you to do any type of incantations you want to do. Go ahead and speak curses. Do what you want to do because I tell you, we are living in the days of a spiritual showdown. My God is going to show you his power is greater than your power. I don't encourage everyone to do that. We're kind of sick, you know, so it's okay. <laughs> now, you've got to know who you are in Christ. You're not walking in compromise, and you've got to understand the authority that you have as a believer before you go into a situation where you're confronting the forces of evil of that nature. Well, my husband picked up his mic, came back up to the front, continued his sermon. Now, one of the things that's significant about that that I'm addressing for just a moment here was that my daughter was in the separate building. She went up to my brother and she said, Uncle Randy, evil just came into this place. And he looked at his watch and it was nine o'clock. She said, I don't know what this means, but I have the word warlock. What is that? My brother comes to me after church and said, what happened in here at nine o'clock? I said, well, a warlock came in here. He's like, whoa, you know? And I'm saying that because we often think that God's only going to flow through specific people. Now, I have to tell you that the warlock, whose name was John, continued to come back. He, he had cancer in his body. He brought friends with him to church. But uh, he accepted Christ before he passed on from this life. Amen? He's in heaven. We'll see him again one day. Because we're not afraid to confront the demonic powers. And, and I, I get really frustrated because there were people who've been Christians for years and a demoniac can start manifesting at the altar or in the congregation or in the seats and the people of God get afraid. They want to get up and run. And it's like they don't even understand. They, they can quote the scripture. They can tell you greater is he that's in me. But it's just a head knowledge and it's not a heart knowledge. So we've got to overcome the fear of the demonic forces. Satan, he knows, you know, he could just play havoc in half of our churches, in half of our lives, half of our homes, because we are afraid of the demonic power when he begins to manifest. And I'm here to challenge you today to rise above that. Amen? That's not the will of God. The will of God is for us to stand strong and firm in the face of every adverse situation and to be bold and to go forth and to do the exploits of God, to bring deliverance to those that are around. 
And, and so I want you to overcome that mindset that, that it, you're afraid and you're, you're intimidated to confront the forces of the enemy. There's a passage in Mark that I love to use. Uh, chapters, uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Jesus is performing miracles here. And he says, And immediately he rose and took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all of the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. When is the last time that someone came into your Bible study or your church or your Sunday school class and they were stood there amazed because of the display of the power of God that took place in, in their presence? And they left saying, we never saw it on this fashion. It, it's not happening in most churches. It's not happening. Now, this is not a ticket for you to go home and be judgmental towards the pastors, towards the leadership, because they're not in a flow that you think they're supposed to be in. You may have to re-evaluate what church you belong in, but at the same place, you need to intercede that the, passion, the pastors and the leaders would get a revelation of how it's so important for us to step in to this flow of the Spirit and begin to demonstrate the power of God. And unfortunately, many pastors, they have gotten a little bit confused in, in, and sidetracked from what our calling has been and why we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and they've forgotten about the power and the power gifts that we are to operate in. And because of that, uh, they get nervous and they're afraid if they give an altar call, what if nobody comes? Or what if they aren't healed? But you see, that's not the responsibility. It's not your responsibility. If you go into a hospital to pray for somebody, they're not healed. It's not your responsibility because you're not the healer. It is your responsibility to be obedient. You see, that's, that's the difference there. And so we can't think that we're the Savior and we're not the healer. But we do, we'll uh, give account before God if we have been obedient to what he has mandated for us to do. Now, that was not the sermon. But that's what I really felt prompted to, to open and to share with that. Uh, because I really think that, that we need to be women who are walking about demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? People should come up to you and they should notice the difference in your life. They should be asking you things about the difference in your life. We went into a coffee shop the other day and the waitress was, oh, she was so demonized. And she just, every time she would walk near, she would just manifest. She'd go back in, into the back room to get, you know, stuff, you know, through the, like the swinging door to get food or coffee or whatever to bring out to people. And she would, she'd get in there and then she'd open the door a little bit and she'd peek out and look at us and then she'd back back in, you know. Well, we weren't doing anything. We were just being normal and sitting there and talking and sharing and visiting. But it was the spirit of God that is with inside of me that I made a decision to release. And see, that's part of the problem. We, we become so selfish. We think that it's all about us. And it's not about us. God has blessed us and given us gifts for us to use them for his glory, to use them for his kingdom, to, to come in and to shake the very forces of darkness. The spirits inside of this waitress identified the spirits inside of us. And she was uncomfortable in our presence. It happens all the time, everywhere we go. And it should happen. And it should be happening in your life. And it should be happening in your children's lives. Some of the times the kids will come home and talk about teachers and situations they have to deal with. Do you know what? Many times it's because that the children are operating in a realm of the Spirit of God and the teacher is not. And so the Spirit, it's a Spirit thing. And there's a clash that's taking place there. Now, um, Pat, as she was speaking a while ago, began to talk on something. She got me a little nervous. She started talking about Herod as he was killing the babies. And she began to talk about the purpose of that. And that is a little bit about what I want to talk about because I want to tell you something today. That generational curses are real. But generational blessings and mantles are incredible. Amen? And they go to the thousandth generation. The curses go to the third and fourth generation, but the blessings go to the thousandth generation. And I'm here to tell you that the warfare you have been under is not about you. 
Sometimes we are so prideful, we think that we're so important that everything's just about us. It ain't about us. It's about our seed. The devil knows the anointing that is upon your seed. It's been prophesied for years. I don't even know how long now. 12, 15 years about the uh, revival coming through the children, coming through the young people. It's about our seed. And we need to understand that there is greatness in you and there is greatness in your family lineage. And you keep pressing on for God and God is going to honor your faithfulness and God is going to touch your children. Some of you are sitting here today and there's a spirit of grief that has you bound because your kids have heard the word of God, but they turned and they've gone the wrong way. And you have grieved and you have said, but God, I know my children had a call upon their life. They had a call to follow you and to honor you. And now look at them. They're walking in all of this error of their way. And I'm here to tell you that God's word is true. It cannot lie. And he's going to honor your intercession. And he's going to honor your cries and your tears. Now some of you need to take your hands off and let God do it because you're getting in the middle of his work. But if you would trust him, he's going to turn the situation around. And I'm speaking to you this morning out of the book of Judges. And I'm talking to you about the Jezebel spirit in conjunction with the life of Samson. Because as I said yesterday, a Jezebel spirit has come to abort the anointing of God. To abort. Some of you in this room, you've had physical abortions. Some of you in this room, because that you walked in compromise, you have been used by the enemy to cause spiritual abortions to take place in other people's lives. Now today we're here to reverse that thing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're here to understand that it's time for us to reclaim our families, reclaim our household. Amen. And to stop letting ourselves walk around in defeat. Can I tell you something? God did not create you to fail. And some of us, we can have all the faith in the world till it comes to our family, till it comes to our situation. And we don't have faith and we've given up. You can't give up. You've got a war to wage. If you stop praying for them, who is going to pray for them? You're the greatest intercessor your household has. So you can't give up. Amen. Today we are reclaiming the generations. We're reclaiming our families and we are making declarations in the spirit realm, in the heavenlies. We are making declarations that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now I'm going to talk to you. Uh, my mother told me, don't worry about the time that I could take as long as I wanted. <laughs> That's a mother for you. <laughs> But I am conscious of the time. I know many had to leave already. Uh, they were getting hungry. And uh, most of us probably need a nap before tonight because we're getting so much of the power of God we can't handle it. So I'm incorporating a few messages together. I'm going to try to make it make sense. And I believe that we're going, I, I, can, I hope I can accomplish this in a short amount of time. But if you are wanting to hear more of this, I do have these messages available outside. Jezebel's spirit operates through intimidation, domination, and manipulation. That's the three ways that Jezebel spirit operates. Now, when we look at the life of Samson, as I said, I'm not really going to read much of the scripture, but you will find this story in Judges chapter 13 through 16 and I encourage you to go back and to read it at some point um, We may refer directly to it today, but I just want I'm going to talk to you for a little while out of my heart Okay, because if there's ever been a situation where a Jezebel spirit was in operation A Jezebel spirit came in and identified the fact that this young man from the time of his birth was destined for greatness Destined to be a deliverer for the people of God the Jezebel spirit began to work in this young man's life Samson's mother was one of three women that an angel appeared to, telling her that there was going to be 
a miracle and a birth that was going to take place within their household. She was wanting a child, and so she had this angelic visitation. But with this visitation, there came some requirements. There was a promise. How many of you know that with the majority of promises and prophecies, there are requirements? I'm amazed at how many people want to say, well, that person was a false prophet and that one, you know, because things didn't happen the way they thought they were going to happen. Well, most of the time, the reason they didn't happen the way they thought they were going to happen is because of the compromise and sin in their life. So Samson's mother receives this prophecy, promise, and requirements. Raise this child to avoid three things. The vine... Never cut your hair. The vine, of course, means vineyard, wine, all of that. Never to cut his hair and never to touch a carcass, a dead thing. Okay? Now, we're going to see as this young man's life begins to develop what happens here. And this is right where some of you are. The Spirit of God just laid this on my heart. And I said I wanted to come in here and preach a, a glory shout and get an excited kind of a message. But, but some of us, we can shout once we get our families in alignment. And we do what we need to do in our house. Okay, we have a responsibility. Some of you are single mothers. You are the priest of that house. And you have a responsibility. See, when I, as I raise my children... I, am, I recognize the anointing upon their life. I recognize they're called by God. My son was three years old when an angel visited him in his room. And he came and woke us up. And he said, come in my room. He's in my room again. Come see him. And he's tears streaming down his face. And my husband and I went into his room. And we could see nothing. He said, don't you see him? Don't you hear him? He's telling me how I'm going to preach for him, how I'm going to sing for him. I'm going to write songs, and I will do that by the time I'm age seven. When he was six and a half, he was sitting in my husband's office at the church one day, and he pulled out a Bible. He really couldn't read very well at six and a half, and he's flipping through like he was reading. And I said, Brandon, what are you doing? Mom, I'm going to be seven in just a few weeks. He said, and I had to get my sermon ready. <laughs> when he was seven, he preached his first message. It only took him five minutes, but he preached his message. He preached on Samuel and Eli, and he gave an altar call for the, everyone in there. He said, because you all need to be yielded for God to use you, because you're never too young, and you're never too old for God to use you. He's 20 now, he just got ordained, and he's the youth pastor on staff at our church, wanting to quit college every day because he wants to go in full-time ministry. I've shared with you some things about my daughter's life. Now, I want you to listen to me. I haven't done everything perfectly, but my mother stood up here yesterday, and she shared with you, and she told you how that uh, it was through her family devotions she imparted into my life. My father is an incredible minister. My mother's a powerful woman of God, quiet by nature. She plays the organ and all that. She does speak on occasion. But sitting in a quiet time at home, sharing scriptures and teaching us the word of God, I accepted the Lord. The responsibility of a mother, of a grandmother even. Let's go there. Grandmothers depositing into the lives of their seed because some grandmothers here your children aren't walking with God but when you have those grandbabies around you and in your house you need to be depositing God in them but what I want to tell you is that my we learned to make room for our children in the ministry you have to do that you have to make room for them you have to make a place for them and you have to recognize that they hear from God and many of us, we have hurt the development in our own kids because when they would come and tell us things that God was showing them, we're, oh, I'm busy, go away. When God was showing them things. Here's a mother, Samson's mom with a promise that baby boy is born. The word doesn't say that they had a little dedication ceremony like we do or you know, in our city, people, you know, in our church, they are Catholic, so they still call it christening. So whatever you want to call it. But we have dedication services. And so um, 
You know, I feel like that's what happened, though. I feel like when the mother said, yes, I will have this child, and I will keep these vows and teach him these vows. But as the beginning of chapter 14 starts here in Judges, it says, and Samson went down to Timnath. Timnath is known as the place of the vine. What were the three vows he was not to break? He went to the place of the vine and he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. And his father said to his mother, and his mother said to him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. That's all lust. Flesh. This is repeated another time in Scripture. He says this same thing again. Parents now who've raised a child taught him certain ways. He began by violating one of the things he had been commanded to keep. One of the laws he commanded to keep. How many of you know that when you begin to walk in compromise that each step you take, it becomes easier and easier to ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit gives checkpoints along the way. I believe that He speaks to our hearts and He says, whoa, you're taking the wrong step, you're doing the wrong thing, you're getting involved with the wrong people. Hear me, some of you in here, you are involved with the wrong people. I, I, some of you, it's a dating relationship, single mothers, and it's a dating relationship. Some of you, that's not the case. Some of you, it's not a dating relationship, but it's a matter that you have joined yourself up. I feel in my spirit that there's one or more people here. You've joined yourself up with the wrong business partners and associates. And it's causing tremendous havoc and misery within your life. That's very important. I, I pray every day for divine appointments and divine relationships. For me, my husband, our ministry, our children. We can't just hook up with anybody that comes along. His father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord. He sought an occasion against the Philistines. It goes on down in verse 5. Then went Samson down and his father and mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. He keeps going back now. He's going back there. Because something's there that satisfies his flesh. She pleaseth me well. So he's going back down to the same place. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Notice this next phrase. I, as you can tell, use the King James Version. And you will see that this phrase and this wording is used several times about Samson's life. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord moved mightily upon him, came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating, and came to his father and mother. And he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So here's this young man who had been longed for, whose parents raised him and taught him the ways of God, taught him the things he was and was not to do, things he was to get involved with and not to get involved with. And he is bringing grief to them. He is going to places he has been commanded not to go in order to have something that pleases the lust of his flesh. He goes back, takes his parents with him because they figure, well, if this is what he's going to do, I might as well at least see the girl. So they come now with him down to Timnath, to the vineyards. They get down there, and there's the lion roaring, as I read. He kills the lion. Then it says that he went and took the honey out of the carcass. Remember the three vows. He's now broken two vows. Two vows. Don't we do this all the time? We desensitize ourselves to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We deafen our ears because we don't want to hear what he's saying. He gets the honey, and now he can't tell his parents why and where he got the honey from. Secrets now. Now a family's being divided. There's secrets that are taking place. 
You know, when people are walking in sin, they suddenly have all kinds of secrets. They used to have time to talk to you all the time. They could share their heart. They could share their vision. But now there are secrets there. And a family's being ripped apart. But more important than that, the destiny of an anointed young man is at stake because he has already disobeyed two of the vows. You know the story. I'm not going to take the time to read it. It goes on to tell how that when he gets, uh, he goes to and has a, like a celebration and there comes a bet, a riddle regarding the uh, honey and where did the source of the honey come from? As the scripture reads on, it says that the men who wanted this riddle, they wanted to find the answer for this riddle. And so as a result of that, they went to his wife that he had to have because she pleased him well. And the betrayal in Samson's life begins. And they said to her, entice him. Isn't that amazing how the enemy knows our weakness? This man had a stronghold of lust in his life. <laughs> he was a man of God, and the Spirit of the Lord was moving mightily upon him. Now, we're not going to beat up on the men right now because there's a lot of women in here. Women of God, bound by pornography, bound by lust, got all kinds of compromise in your life. Yet the Spirit of the Lord, because the gifts and calling are without repentance, still can move through your life. And so it enables you to desensitize yourself to the convictions of the Holy Spirit and to continue plundering further into your sinful ways, believing the lies of the enemy that you can get away with it. So now we see that this uh, situation here where they tell her, entice him to find out the answer. After she enticed him, they said, if you don't entice him and get the answer, we're going to burn you and your father and your household. That's what they're going to do. This is the threat they give her. So she kind of kind of had an ultimatum. So she told them the answer to the riddle. So when, when Samson found out that he had been betrayed, he was so angry. He went and he killed 30 men and took their 30 garments because this was the bet he had to pay off. So he goes and he pays off this debt with these 30 garments of clothing. And he's so angry that he decides after then because he realized the betrayal that had taken place. He runs home to his mom and dad. That I'm sure for him as a man was humiliating because they had tried to get him not to go to Timnath in the first place. Not to take a daughter that he was not supposed to have, but he didn't listen. He's broken two of the vows. So now we have a situation where he's uh, upset. He, he's sitting home with mom and dad, but he gets to thinking about it. He was like, you know, but she really pleased me well. I really want her. I guess I can suck it up and I can go back and I can, you know, make up with her and everything's going to be all right. So he took to her what was considered a special gift at that time. He took a lamb to her. And, and the, word, the word tells all of this. I'm just synopsizing it. I told my husband, it was a baby goat, actually, he took to her. I said, uh, Garland, if we ever get in a spat, honey, I don't want a goat. Bring me some roses and chocolate will do. I don't want a goat. But it was considered a delicacy in that time. And so he was bringing back his offering, peace offering, make up with her, get everything going again, get everything set okay. But when he gets there, he finds out yet another betrayal has taken place because his father-in-law gave Samson's bride to the guy who was the best man at the wedding. What a tangled web. So now he's really angry. So he did some really logical things at this point. He went and caught 300 foxes. Anger drives you to do some crazy things. I assume he had some kind of a pen or fence that he built to put them in. He gets these foxes and he, he puts them in there and it's not enough to have the foxes. No, that's not enough. He takes them and turns them back to back and he has a, ties their tails together. I have an imagination. I assume that he, as he's doing this, that the, they're biting him and everything and they're pulling away from each other because they don't want to be attached to each other. 
And he didn't stop there. He's got 150 pairs of foxes and he sets their tails on fire and sends them running through the enemy's crops because he's mad, mad about his wife. Which if he had adhered to the commandments of God, he would have never been in this mess in the first place. He burns up all of their crops. They become angry with him. So for vengeance, we have this whole vengeance thing back and forth, back and forth that's taking place here. So they decide that what they're going to do is they're going to go and burn his wife and father in the house. That's the same thing she had been threatened with in the first place. Do you remember? The passage goes on. They tie him with the new cords, and he breaks forth the cords, and he keeps on breaking out of everything they're trying to bind him with. And throughout these passages of Scripture here, the word of the Lord keeps saying here that the Spirit of the Lord would come mightily upon him again. I, I think this is a real key here. Because I think we, under, we, we, we get confused sometimes as about people in ministry and in leadership why God still moves on them. But you, can, you have to look at this passage and understand that the gifts and calling are without repentance. This is why Saul in the Old Testament still could prophesy even though he was not right in his heart with God. Because he came in the presence of God and the gifting still would operate. And that's what's happening with Samson. Why? Because he was an anointed seed just like your children. Just like you, you are somebody else's anointed seed, destined for greatness. And some of us have made as many mistakes as Samson has made. Now, we all know how the story ends, although I'm going to take you just through a couple of more steps about it, because I really think it's important, these truths that are here, to see what's happening and to see how that the Holy Spirit keeps giving checkpoints, yet he keeps ignoring them. So he, uh, he goes on in um, the next chapter, okay, you know, the ending of that chapter, he says, um, he goes out and he takes a donkey's jawbone. Now picture this. He's not even supposed to touch a dead thing. <laughs> Yet God's anointing on him, even though he's in disobedience, he's holding the dead thing. And he kills the thousands of the enemy. And then he cries out to God. And he says, God, I've slayed all these enemies. Are you going to let me die of thirst? And God, once again, supernaturally touches this inanimate object, this donkey jawbone, and causes water to come forth out of it to supply his thirst, something he's not even supposed to touch. But yet miracles are happening through it because of the anointing of God upon his life, the call of God upon his life. And it's causing him to think, I can keep getting away with this sin. As the next chapter opens, it says he goes down to Gaza. Gaza in Hebrew means stronghold. What is his stronghold? Lust. Women. He goes there. Now you and I don't know that that means that. We don't know Hebrew and Greek, most of us. We would have to study it. But he knew what it meant. And he walked right into the city called Stronghold. And ends up with a harlot. And now his life is being threatened, and he's got to leave and flee in the middle of the night, and he just decides he'll take the gates of the city with him while he goes, hey, <laughs> leave an impact, leave a memory here. <laughs> then he falls into the loving arms of Jezebel, who lived in the valley of Sorek. And Sorek means the place of the choice vine. Come on. I get so frustrated when people want to make so many excuses for their sin. <laughs> you know what I mean, Lila? They walk right into it. Very few people are tricked into a lifestyle of sin. Very few people. Most people know exactly what they're doing, but we have become so, uh, such masters at justifying our actions. He ends up there with Delilah and same thing again. The men said, entice him to find out where is the power of his strength. He's got the same problem because the enemy knew the weaknesses that were there. 
and the enemy targeted the weaknesses. We know that she betrayed him. She told the answer. She told uh, how he got his power and that it was, he was never to cut his hair. And we all know it wasn't that the power was in his hair. That was just symbolic of the lifestyle of obedience that he was supposed to walk in. And now all three of the Nazarite vows are broken. God in his mercy still used Samson. Amen? Because as he was grinding at the mill and his eyes are plucked out, he's now blind. His hair is growing back again. And he was led by a little boy, he's a blind man, into the uh, arena and put his hands on the pillars and, and he brought down the arena and it cost him his own life. He did slay many of the enemies. Researchers say that he and Christ are the two that through their death killed or accomplished so much devastation against the work of the enemy. I should clarify that, Christ didn't kill anybody, but he caused devastation against the work of the enemy. Okay, so he did accomplish things. He's actually, uh, by some researchers, considered as a type of Christ. But when I read this story, it's more to me than a man with strong muscles and long hair and a woman who, who wanted to cut his hair. It's more than that story. And I think that many times we don't stop to take Old Testament stories and really plow into them and study them and understand what the Word of God is trying to teach us through these stories that are written here. You see, this is symbolic to me of a man who did not understand the cost of the consequences of compromise. We're going to pay when we allow compromise to enter our life. He was a man that was born to be a deliverer of the people of God. Yes, he killed a few people in his lifetime, but he did not accomplish all that he was destined to accomplish because he chose to ignore the checkpoints of the Holy Spirit along the way. Yes, there was a Jezebel spirit in operation in his life. Do you know that demon spirits, familiar spirits are familiar with you? The spirits don't multiply. They do intensify. Two-thirds, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a third of the angels that were cast out of heaven with Satan, when L Lucifer, when he was hurled out of heaven, these demonic spirits, they have a strategy, they have a hierarchy in which that they operate and in which they work. And they know us, they study us, they know our weaknesses. They know our family lineage. And the same spirit that used to plague Aunt Susie will try to revisit the next generation with the same, uh, if it's a sickness, with the same type of a sickness, with the same type of aches and, you know, stuff in their body, with the same type of strongholds, with the same type of, of things. Demonic spirits in operation, trying to abort the anointing, trying to stop the anointing. And we as a body of Christ have got to recognize what's going on and recognize Satan has a strategy. We walk blindly into so many situations, happy-go-lucky, oh, I'm a tongue-talking Christian, you know, just so happy and everything, and we're like floating around up here and not understanding why it seems like we're getting waylaid and bombarded by the enemy. It's because we never stop to, to seek the face of God and to analyze and to study the strategies of the enemy. But he uses strategies against our lives, strategies to stop us, because he knows more about what you are destined for than you do. Somebody might have prophesied it to you. God might have spoken it to you. He might have showed you. But most of us don't truly believe it. We think, oh, wouldn't that be awesome? That's a cute little word. Tuck that away somewhere. That'd be really cute if that happened. That'd be really sweet. And we don't really believe them. And we don't really fight for the promise. If you read the Word of God, you read the Old Testament, when promises were given, people fought to bring those promises into reality. Okay? And we don't fight enough for the promises that God has given us. And God wants us to fight for those promises. I'm telling you that you are anointed. I'm telling you it doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. God is a God of a second chance. You might have made as many mistakes as Samson did or more. 
you know, knowing what you were doing, walking right into it, affecting other people's lives, affecting other people's souls. But our merciful God forgives and he restores and the spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you again and he will use you. He wants to minister to you. I feel today that there's a word that needs to be shared in this house about restoration. There are some of you that you, you are so bound by condemnation and guilt for the things that you have done in your life, in your past. You can't seem to get set free from that. But God is here to restore you. And it's going to take a restoration in the mind, in the thought processes, in the memory. Stop going back and revisiting those places. God brought you out of those places. So stop going back there. What can never lead people into the presence of God as beautifully as these women have done, as they've ministered and they've shared and, and they've, they've challenged each one of us. If we don't come to a place that we make up our mind, I am not going to walk in compromise and I'm going to intercede for my seed that they would come in proper alignment with the destiny God has appointed for their life. Amen. Amen. Some of you have given up on the dream. You've given up on the promise. You've given up on your kids. And I'm here today to challenge you and hopefully to spark faith into your heart, to cause you to remind yourself of the promises God gave you. He did not change his mind. He was not on drugs the day he gave you the promise. He knew what he was doing. And it was his promise that came forth to you. So why would you ignore that? Why do we tune in? You know, the spirit realm is speaking all the time. I know I'm jumping all around here. I've hit familiar spirits, and I don't even think I completed my thought. I don't make, think I made sense. But I've got so much I want to say, and I don't have enough time. I'm talking fast as I can. Okay. I'm just concerned because I think we've given up on our seed. You know what? I love young people. You know what I'm doing in just a few weeks? I'm taking 200 and something young people to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Dear in Mardi Gras, I love kids. I'm going to be in the altar. I'm going to cry my makeup off and mess up my hair. I'm going to snot. I'm going to do everything. Praying them through to the victory, okay? I'm going to prophesy to them. I'm going to cast devils out of them, and then I'm going to sit up in the hallway with them at night, all night long, and act a fool. Because I am still a kid inside. And my church is mostly African-American, about 60% African-American. That's why some of y'all came and said, man, your daughter sings like she's black. I said, she thinks she is. She don't know. Don't tell her any different. My God. And so they dance and they do all this, you know, whatever, and they try to get me to do it. I got no coordination. I do have rhythm. It was a sin to dance when I was a kid. We didn't even have a TV in the house. We did rent a TV when the World Series came on because God was in that. I don't know. So when my parents would leave the house, I would sneak the TV. It was on wheels into my room before we had to take it back to the rental place. And I would watch Soul Train. And I tried to get my body to move because it was inside of me. And then I repented because I, I knew everything was a sin. Everything was a sin. to come out of a place where we, we've given up on the generation of young people. This generation of young people is the most incredible generation that's ever walked the earth. Some of you, it's your children. Some of you, it's your grandchildren. Some of you are school teachers and you've got them in a class every day. What an opportunity to impart into the lives of young people. What an opportunity to raise up an army of kids. Prophesy to him. Demonstrate his power. And they're going to want what you've got. They'll follow you anywhere. Amen. And have fun with them. Don't be so spiritual you can't have fun. Really. You know, we've got to be.
be real. We've got to touch their hearts. We've got to tap into them. In the name of Jesus, I come against every lying spirit in, that has been tormenting women of God. They have tuned into the spirit realm. That's where I was going. You've tuned into the spirit realm because the spirit realm speaking all the time. Evil spirits and the spirit of God. Who have you been listening to? What channel have you got to turn to? I have a choice every day to listen to the spirit of God or to entertain the demonic spirits that talk to me all the time, trying to silence me, trying to make me bound by fear, trying to make me feel, in, 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 you know, like intimidated, trying to make me feel that when I give prophetic words that they're going to be off the wall and they'll be wrong, trying to silence me. I have a choice. And you have a choice too. And you have been listening, many of you, to the wrong spirits. You've been listening to spirits of defeat. Spirits that are telling you that your family will never be one. And that your family will never walk in the purpose God had for them. And I've come today as a servant of God to tell you that those are lies from the enemy. You better seal off those ears and stop listening to the lies of the enemy. And go into the spirit realm and claim your family for the kingdom and the purposes of God. It's time to wage a war. Stop letting Jezebel win. I tell my kids, you know, and they're good looking. I'd like to say they both look like me, but they don't. All of us, you know, your kids are good looking too. We know, you know. And I tell them, people are going to want you. Honey, people are going to want you, not just because you're good looking. She's so skinny, I don't want to have that happen. We don't know. I said, you got a cute little figure, you're beautiful. You got a great voice, sing like any black girl out there with that blonde hair. You, you know, you got a great personality, you're a lot of fun. Some of them are not going to see any of that. They're not even going to understand why they're drawn to you. But the spirit inside of them that works identifies the anointing of God inside of her. And the fact that she has said yes to the call of God, whatever the cost. They identify that. And they begin to come in to pray, to distract, to destroy. Some of you, it's happened with your kids. And some of you, it's happened with you. Now, I'm going to say something that's probably going to make a lot of you mad, but I tend to do that. There are single women in this room that you have been so consumed of running after your own passions and your lusts because you found something that pleaseth you well and you have forgotten about your seed. I really think you're going to give account to God for that. really do. We've had to deal with some situations in our church in the past several months. I want to slap some folks. I really did. And I've never been in a fight in my life. I said, you met him on the Internet. Your husband died two months ago. You've got kids here. Well, they're almost grown. They're kids that have a call of God on their life. They're not finished grieving over their dad who's law, who, who passed away. And now you're running after your passions to marry somebody you met on the Internet. Give me a break. Sometimes I like to take the, the, the Internet, the computer, and just put a bomb in it. good and bad at the same time. I want to tell you something. I've been blessed with a godly man. I was 12 on our first date to a church sweetheart banquet. We've been together our whole life. I fasted for a week at the age of 12 that he would ask me to the sweetheart banquet. I knew what I wanted. <laughs> Only my mother and daddy knew what I was fasting for. Because 
I didn't want to tell anybody else because you know how kids are. They want to go say, Beverly likes you. <laughs> I wasn't going to let that happen. I wanted if God was in it, it would happen. And if he wasn't, I'd go by myself and sit at home and cry. <laughs> I was okay. I wanted God's will. Amen. Because I was raised by parents who taught me the importance of aligning myself with the wrong person. Please, if you've been through a divorce, I'm not here to condemn you. But I am here to tell you before you rush into another relationship, please stop and think. Think about your seed. And please know that many people will play games to act like they are interested in your seed. I mean, come on. Sometimes we act so dumb. God gave you a good mind to think and he gave you discernment. Proceed. Look at what's going on. And even though my husband and I pastor a, a wonderful congregation, and some of our ladies are here, and they've been assisting me this week, they're wonderful people. And God has blessed us with two children who are pursuing ministry. And do you know that every decision I make of my life, I consider them as well as seeking the face of God? I really do. Because if I do the wrong thing, see, I, I grew up watching a lot of preachers, kids who were bitter, carrying the mantle, carrying the anointing, but they were bitter. Because mom and dad had time for everybody else, but no time for them. So therefore, there's a seed of young people called to ministry, or people my age, I guess you could say they're young, I'm in my 40s. Thank you. You can have a book, okay? Take whatever you want, okay? She's got a red scarf on, y'all, a tan jacket. She was sweet to me. <laughs> but my point is that they're, they're anointed and they're not pressing on and carrying that call because they got aborted by people in the church who attacked them or because of their misperception because mom and dad were so busy with the work of the ministry, they didn't have time for them. And I said, I'm not going to let that happen to my kids. i got the biggest burden in the world for preacher's kids. We've been going to preacher's kids conferences lately. My kids are speaking at it. And I wish they'd let me speak, but I'm too old to speak there. But Because uh, they're using the kids to speak to the kids, and it's awesome. It is awesome. And I just, I just trying to challenge you today. I feel like I'm rambling. I'm trying to say so much in, a, in this message. And, and I apologize if I'm rambling, but please... Remember the promises of God and please evaluate your decisions. You know what I get? Her junior senior banquet's coming up. Now she went on her first date a few weeks ago. The boy came in and brought her roses and I burst out crying. Aww. Hello. She could have died. She's 16. I'm not handling it well. I need prayer or deliverance. Can you help me? <laughs> Her junior, senior banquet's coming up. It's not a prom. She goes to a school who doesn't believe in dancing, so. <laughs> sometimes that's good, y'all. I won't have to worry about no close dancing, you know. So sometimes that tradition ain't so bad. If I need to just pull on that a little bit, I can pull it back in. And people called me to preach somewhere that weekend. Do you know what? I had that on my calendar. I said, no, I need to be here for my daughter that weekend. Amen. Because as a mother, my highest calling in ministry is to my husband and to my children. Yeah. That is my highest calling. <laughs> my daughter's here with me this weekend. Last week I preached in Denver. My son was with me there. They're a part of the ministry. And I'm telling you, so many people I know, maybe it's not y'all, they run after their own passions and make their own decisions, and they never one time stop to think about their kids. And if their kids have a problem with it, then they want to tell them, well, you just better deal with it and get over it. Well, honey, you better deal with it and get over it. God gave you those children. They were a blessing, but they're a seed. And there's greatness in them. What are you doing to develop it? You want to know why they're rebellious and why they're bitter? You did it. Right. Running after your own selfish passions. Don't get all mad at Samson. Some of you are doing the same thing. It's time for an altar call.
Paul, aren't you excited? You ready to run down here? <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. And I'm going to tell you what we're doing. I'm just going to mix it all in here together. You know which category you fit in. Maybe you're a mother, grandmother, aunt, godmother, what? I don't know. That you have given up on the promises of God. Because when you look at your life and at the life of your family, all you see is them running in the error of their ways. And you've given up on the promises. And today you need to come and you need to repent and say, God, forgive me for not believing the promise. Forgive me for doubting. Help thou mine unbelief. Because when I look at the situation, I find it hard to believe you're intervening. But I'm going to stand upon your promise. And I'm going to believe that you're working in ways even when I can't see it. Even when I don't identify it. Now that's one group of you. There's some others in here and you need to repent. And I'm doing it all together so you won't be embarrassed. Because it's between you and God. <laughs> but some of you in here, you've been running after your own passions. The same way Samson has. You've been so afraid of living your life alone. So afraid of not having somebody to be there with you. That you have made the wrong choices. And you have aligned yourself with the wrong people. You need to repent. Some of you, you've already married the wrong person. Well, I'm not telling you go home and divorce. This is not a license for you to divorce. Please make sure that's on the tape. But I am telling you, you need to maybe go home and sit down with your children. You need to humble yourselves and apologize. You need to say, Mama was wrong. You just be real. Be honest with them. They will respect you. Kids know and they see right through people. And I tell you, I've given 16 years of my life to young people. And I know. So just be real with them. If you will let down the facades, they will forgive you. They will embrace you. They will try to help you work your way through the situation. If you'll just say, I messed up. I was afraid. I didn't want to live my life alone. I didn't want to raise you kids by myself. And I ran after my passion and I messed up. Honey, you need to heal the relationship with your children. They are your gift. They are your seed. And there's ministry and greatness in them. Some of you, it may be grandparents that need to heal and mend some bridges that are there that, are, that have been broken because of, of, you've allowed the enemy to come into relationships. The Jezebel spirit's going to come. It's going to come. It's the enemy of revival. It's the enemy of a move of God. I'm not afraid of it. I know it's coming. I've studied about it. I understand its strategy. I understand it works through men and women because it's a spirit, knows no gender. We've dealt with some men that were bigger Jezebels than some of the women I knew. It's going to come to affect you, to affect your seed, your business, your ministry. It will come. You've got the Bible, you've got incredible at the bookstore and other areas and in the resource product, the tent, the, all these ladies have items out there. You've got tools at your hand to teach you, to equip you so that you can stand strong in the face of adversity. Amen? And that you can win your families for God. Oh, isn't that the most awesome thing? The most awesome thing to know that you won your family for God. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads? Father, I just thank you so much for your word. There's so many truths locked up in your word, and we miss them half the time. We read it, and we only get bits and portions of it. Thank you, Father, that your word says that revelation knowledge is going to be increased in this season that we live in. So, Father, help us, O oh God, as our understanding increases and as our passion for you grows, Lord, that, that we would want, O oh God, to constantly reevaluate our lives.
making everything right in our life so that your perfect will can be accomplished in and through us. Today, oh God, in the spirit realm, as I said at the beginning, I declare that we are recapturing souls. We are recapturing families. And Father, we are declaring today that those families that have been broken and divided asunder, Lord, Father, that you are bringing healing and you are mending these situations and these broken lives, oh God. Father, there are parents in this room, Father, that know that they've been in error. But God, I pray you would give them the ability, Lord, to go home and to, to make things right with their children, oh God. Father, there are single women in this room and you spoke to me and you said to preach this message because you said there are single women in this room that are throwing away their destiny just as Samson did because they're so worried about running after their passions and what pleases them God this is a day of repentance for them Spirit of God deal with their hearts bring conviction cause them to come in repentance to you Lord Father, we're reclaiming our children. We will not be controlled by a Jezebel spirit. I break it. I defy that power in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, that we can stand upon your promise that your blessings go to the thousandth generation. Our seed is blessed. Hallelujah. Our seed is blessed. There's greatness in our seed. And they will follow you, God. Hallelujah. And they will do great and mighty exploits. Even for this purpose, we've been raised up. We're going to demonstrate your power. Our children are going to demonstrate your power. Our grandchildren. In Jesus' name, amen. Just opening the altars. I already shared, the Spirit of God has dealt with your heart. If you feel you need to come and pray, then you just come and find a place to, to seek the face of God. If it's repentance, if it's intercession for your family, I don't know what the need may be. We want to reclaim our families for the kingdom. Hallelujah.